Okay, uh, good morning everyone. Uh, welcome back to uh, ELEC 3204. Uh, hope you have all been well. Stay warm. I guess one of the benefits of uh, having an online classroom is that you don't you don't actually have to go out into the cold to uh, attend lecture. Um, yeah, I hope I will get to understand today. Um, so actually today uh, is going to be a big day. Um, uh, we are going to cover a lot of uh, very important things, all the equations, figures, uh, concepts we are going to talk about today are very, very important. Um, so uh, probably I'll go a little bit faster today. Uh, if anything is not clear, uh, send me an email. I have uh, received a few emails from you, all very good questions. Um, so if I if I have time, I will come back to uh, to the slides which, which I didn't make it clear, and uh, try from different angle. Um, otherwise, uh, please remember to uh, stick to the slides. Uh, sometimes I make mistakes. Um, uh, I will try to correct them uh, after I hear my own lecture afterwards. So all the lectures are. Uh, recorded. Um, but anyway, uh, always stick to the slides. Uh, try to understand uh, all the sentences, all the figures, and all the equations uh, in the slides. Uh, sometimes I would say, for example, this this uh, picture um, or this equation is not important or is not required for you to uh, uh, to repeat. Then you know that is uh, like a general knowledge, um, but otherwise they are all very important. Right, so today we're finally going to talk about uh, Doppler effect. You probably have learned it before this course, and I have mentioned it many times before. Uh, this uh, you know who. Um, but today we're going to uh, look at the equations that represent Doppler effect and how it's uh, affecting uh, fast fitting. Today we're going to uh, finish uh, the saga of uh, channel modeling and then start talking about uh, modulation afterwards. So uh, first Doppler effect. Suppose you have a base station really far away, somewhere uh, very far away there, and uh, the, the, the mobile station uh, was initially located at location B, right? Um, and then over a time interval of uh, delta T, the mobile station travels to location A, so the signal path originally should follow this path, um, but after delta t, the signal path become this one. Suppose the base station is very far away, so the two paths they can be considered uh, parallel to each other. Um, so what is uh, um, um, so from this figure, uh, the most visible effect that you can observe is that uh, the two paths, they have a difference in length. So originally the signal should follow this path, but now the signal follows this path. So there is a difference in, uh, uh, in length of uh, the, uh, the signal path. Right, and this angle is uh, angle of uh, arrival. So uh, if you, uh, if the mobile station has traveled a distance of D, we can evaluate uh, this difference in signal pass uh, by this. So delta L equals to D times cosine alpha, right? Um, so um, eventually we all know that Doppler effect changes the wavelength or changes the frequency of the signal. 
uh, can anyone tell me uh, how to evaluate uh, wavelengths from frequency or how to evaluate uh, frequency from wavelengths? What's the relationship between wavelengths and frequency? So, uh, yes, that's correct. Thank you. So we have frequency, uh, not not exactly though, not one by wavelength. Uh, so frequency equals to speed of light over wavelength. So the frequency of the signal equals to uh, speed of light, which is uh, three times 10 to power eight. divided by wavelength. So eventually Doppler, uh, Doppler effect would uh, change uh, frequency uh, and uh, it would change wavelength. So we all, we all know that uh, the, uh, the unit for frequency is hertz. If, if, if we want to represent um, Doppler frequency, which is how much frequency uh, has changed for this signal uh, uh, center frequency. Um, we need to measure it in hertz. And hertz, in other words, is also called a uh, cycle per second. So it is change in phase over time. So here we have a change in uh, uh, frequency, uh, sorry, a change in pulse uh, distance, so the length of pass, we need to evaluate um, how much frequency has changed. So um, this is a time interval. Um, so the mobile station has traveled a distance of D over, uh, over time interval of uh, delta T and V is the velocity of the mobile station. And uh, suppose, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not the case, but suppose delta, delta L, the difference in signal paths here, happen to be equal to uh, lambda. It's not the case, but let's suppose it's true. Then physics detects that it causes a phase rotation of uh, two pi radians. It's minus here because the paths become shorter. So let's suppose for a moment that uh, the path difference is uh, lambda. Then the phase change is two pi. This is a physics rule. However, in, in, in general, delta L doesn't equal to uh, lambda. So if we want to calculate the change in phase, we need to scale two pi according to the ratio um, of uh, delta L divided by uh, the wavelength. Um, so here, if we extend uh, this representation by uh, but here, so delta, delta L equals to D times cosine um, angle of arrival. So delta L is replaced by this. Then I get this phase change. So as I said before, uh, frequency is a unit of phase change over uh, time interval. So if we, divide, uh, if we put uh, time interval on the left, then we get the frequency change. So Doppler frequency is defined by 33, equation 33 here. Phase change uh, divided by uh, the time interval. And it's normalized because there is a two pi radian in each circle, in each cycle, sorry. So uh, Doppler frequency is uh, unit is hertz. Hertz is uh, per 
uh, cycle per second. So if we put uh, 32 into 33, we get this uh, Doppler frequency. This is the definition of Doppler frequency. And this part here, uh, FM, represents the maximum Doppler frequency. So I'm going to draw a very important analogy uh, to uh, carrier frequency here. So I just said uh, carrier frequency or center frequency of a signal equals to speed of light over wavelengths. And here Doppler frequency is a speed of the vehicle, a speed of mobile station over wavelengths. So you can see uh, that there is a similarity between these two. So I hope that would help you to uh, uh, to remember this equation. Um, so maximum Doppler frequency here. Um, so maximum Doppler frequency defines um, how how much of uh, the signal's frequency change. Um, by the movement of the mobile station. So in, uh, in, um, in general, the whole Doppler frequency can be positive, can be negative because of cosine uh, alpha, right? So the maximum and uh, so the maximum, so it can be positive, it can be negative. Um, when alpha equals to uh, zero degree or pi, um, so Doppler frequency become uh, the positive of the maximum Doppler frequency or the negative of maximum Doppler frequency. So if the mobile station moves straight, uh, right towards uh, the transmitter, then the frequency change is increased to the maximum of uh, vehicle speed by uh, lambda, which is a wavelength. And if if the uh, uh, if um, the mobile station is moving away from the base station, there is a frequency decrease to the maximum of uh, uh, vehicle's uh, velocity by wavelengths. So we can draw another analogy here that uh, um, the case that uh, when you are standing on a, on a, on a plat platform and when there is a train approaching you, so you on the platform is a receiver and there, uh, so for the train whistle, um, you would hear the, the pitch increases as the train approaching you and then the pitch decreases as the trends leaving you. Uh, so from the transmitter's point of view, a, the pitch didn't, didn't actually change. It transmits the same signal as a, uh, at all time. But from the receiver's point of view, so from, from your perspective, uh, it, 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 it's as if that the signal's frequency has changed as from the receiver's uh, point of view. So uh, now we see how can we calculate uh, Doppler effect. Um, so all these equations are now very difficult and they are very important. It's very important to be able to uh, um, represent uh, Doppler frequency, uh, this one here. And uh, here draw analogy to uh, the re relationship between uh, center frequency so the signal's frequency and the signal's wavelengths. Um, so if we have a transmitter and we have a receiver, I've uh, been through this uh, quite a few times now. So if there is a line of sight, we have a Doppler frequency change. We have a Doppler frequency for the line of sight. Okay, that's uh, just one pass. However, we 
have multiple reflections, which is also called multi-pass effect. Multi-pass eff effect is uh, why we have small scale fast fading because replicas of uh, signals, they, they edit together as a receiver, sometimes constructively, some, sometimes destructively. The detrimental effect here is the different paths, they arrive with different delays. And now we understand they will also arrive with different Doppler frequency because they arrive with different angle of arrival. Okay, so it would uh, it would make um, a fast fading or small scale fading more complicated. Um, so we need to understand um, the power distribution, how uh, how Doppler effect um, affects a small fade, uh, sorry of a small scale fading or fast fading. We need to understand how Doppler effect. Uh, affects uh, small scale fading. So one way to uh, analyze this is to uh, uh, is to analyze the power that come from different angles. So this is called power angular density. So we try to analyze the power that come from different angle to the destination. Suppose all the um, receive power is assumed to be uniformly distributed over different angles. So signals they come from different angles, and uh, uh, power is distrib distributed no, uh, uniformly uh, over the range between zero and two pi. Uh, this is not actually the case uh, most of the time, but uh, it helps us to analyze this uh, Doppler effect. Um, However, for example, when there is no line of sight, when you are well in a room, but there is no line of sight, so all the signals uh, that you received are reflected signals. So in this in this scenario, it, it might, might as well be true that uh, the signal you receive from all the different angles they have uh, the same power. Then the uh, power angular density uh, integral over all the angles should equal to one. Then we get this uh, power ang angular density over uh, uh, so we get this power angular density over the infinitesimal um, angle. Uh, being one over two pi. I hope that's that's, that's not that's not unclear. Um, but eventually we want what we want is a Doppler power spectrum density. So power spectrum density. What we get here is a uh, uh, power angular density because we can better uh, visualize it. Uh, we, we can imagine, we can visualize angles, right? So we, we get this uh, power angular density first, but eventually what we want is uh, power spectrum, uh, power spectral density, because we want to see how uh, power is smeared in the frequency domain. So all these signals, they, uh, they come together, they kind of, uh, uh, disperse the vision if it's in uh, vis uh, visible light um, frequency band. So you see those lights, they kind of, uh, the vision kind of uh, dispersed. Um, however, we don't see them uh, in radio frequency uh, frequency band. So all those signals, uh, they kind of uh, still kind of disperse. Uh, they kind of, the signal power kind of spread out over a range of frequency uh, a range of frequencies. So we want to see how the signal power is distributed uh, in the frequency domain. So how do we calculate, calculate that? Is we, need to, we need to use uh, Passivo's theorem. Uh, so Passivo's theorem tells us that uh, the power in the, 
in the angular domain uh, in over uh, um, infinitesimal angle equals to a uh, power in the frequency domain over uh, in over infinitesimal uh, bandwidth. Okay, so these two are equal, and we we have already established that the uh, so angular uh, power spectrum is one by two pi. Then we get uh, the power spectral density equals to uh, equation thirty five. And then uh, the Doppler frequency here is uh, defined by 34 here. So this is the velocity, this is the wavelength, the angle of uh, arrival. So we want to put that into uh, this equation. Uh, here. So Doppler frequency is defined by this, this is the maximum Doppler frequency, and cosine alpha is an even function, so we can just reverse the the sine of alpha, and it doesn't change the value of Doppler frequency. And then we do this uh, inverse function, um, so that we get uh, alpha as a function of Doppler frequency. And then we need to do uh, differentiate. Uh, on uh, cosine uh, inverse function uh, using this tool uh, we get this and then uh, from 35 we put everything together we get 36 um, so basically originally uh, for example, when you have a signal at uh, FC, there is only signal power at FC. But now with uh, with this power spectrum um, density, uh, we have power in the range of FC. We have power in the range of F FC. Uh, Plus and minus is the maximum Doppler frequency. So if I if, if I look at this equation again here, um, we can put this. We can consider this as a constant. So uh, uh, so the constant kind of absorb uh, one over two pi fm, which is the maximum Doppler frequency. And uh, so when Doppler frequency equals zero, uh, that's where we don't have Doppler frequency. So the center frequency, uh, the spectrum is a constant. And when uh, Doppler frequency reach its maximum, this density reach uh, the positive uh, infinity. So it become like a filter here, like a U-shaped filter. There is only power, so it's centered at, top, uh, at uh, the center frequency, the carrier frequency of the signal. And then FC plus FM, or FC uh, minus FM, the power reach to a uh, maximum. And then outside of the range, there's no power at all. So originally, without the frequency, we have signal power in here. But right now with Doppler frequency, it's very detrimental. So power kind of dis, uh, distributed over a range of frequency, uh, a range of frequencies. So the power is distributed over this range. And then outside the, outside the range, there, there's still no power. Um, so why is this important to a uh, small scale fading? Let's recap on the small scale fading a little bit. Um, let's see. Um, Let's 
small scale fitting. Oh yeah, here. So small scale fitting is represented by a complex value. And we have learned that the real part and the imaginary part are both Gaussian distributed, right? So the so amplitudes that you see is in here, the so amplitude over time. So there's actually correlation over time. So this time instant and the next time instant, there's a correlation here. If the real part and the imaginary part are generated, um, so if the real part and imaginary part are generated by completely random uh, Gaussian variable, the amplitude for the amplitude, there will be no correlation at all. It will be completely random. There is no correlation between this instant to the next instance. However, there is normally correlation. Uh, so the so the so the uh, wireless environment doesn't normally change like completely randomly. A change correlated. Uh, so the changes there is correlation in change. So normally, for example, when you are sitting in a room, there is nothing changed in the environment. Um, the fitting envelope would stay the same over time, um, and then. Uh, the fitting envelope we often see, for example, that fig let's look at that figure again. The fitting envelope you normally see is something like this. Uh, this this change quite quickly because you have a speed of uh, 30 miles per, per hour. So normally the envelope would uh, change more slowly when the mobile station move uh, slowly. And then it would change more rapidly when uh, mobile station move more, more more quickly. So let's think of it this way. So if you if you are here, for example, if at this time instant the fitting uh, envelope is, uh, is is this one. And then if you move really really slowly, uh, you it would take you a longer time to uh to experience this deep deep fade. But if you move really quickly, you would walk into this deep fade um, earlier. I'm not sure if that makes sense. So basically, if the above station's speed is uh, smaller, then the fading envelope would be more smooth. Uh, if the mobile station's velocity is uh, quicker, then it will be as so a fluctuation would be uh, more dramatic. So the velocity is uh, linked to Doppler, a cause Doppler frequency. So the correlation is actually defined by Doppler frequency. So Doppler frequency is determined by velocity here. So the quicker, um, the, the, the higher the mobile station speed, the higher the Doppler frequency, okay? And it would change, um, it would uh, change the power spectral density. Just consider this as a filter because outside the range that's defined by maximum Doppler frequency, there's no power. Within the range, there's power. So why do we consider it as a filter? This is normally how we generate fading. So the real part and imaginary part of the fast fading, A, I, and A, J, uh, A, Q, sorry, A, Q. And then this is a real part. This is an imaginary part. Um, so when we when we actually need to generate uh, fading uh, in our simulations, um, we need uh, the, the fading to be as close to how it happens in nature 
as possible, as close as possible. So the correlation between the fading over time should be defined by Doppler frequency, right? So the real part and the imaginary parts, we generate them separately by Gaussian uh, variables. And then what we do is we go through this uh, variable. Um, we, we make this uh, variable go through a low pass filter that's defined by that uh, power spectral uh, density. So the, the low pass filter where outside FM there's no power inside FM there is a U shape. So what does low pass filter do is it doesn't change the statistic of the of the random variable. So it was Gaussian before, it's Gaussian after. But what it, what it does is it imposes correlation between uh, between the variables over time. So it will be very smooth if Doppler frequency is small, and it will be more dramatic if the Doppler frequency is high. But in general, uh, there is correlation between um, the fading of this interval and the fading of the next interval, right? So the purpose of introducing uh, this, fun uh, this equation is for us to be able to immune, um, uh, emulate um, what fading is like in nature. So we are, we are able to simu do simulation on fading channels. Um, that, 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 that is the purpose of uh, this uh, equation. Um, it's more important, it's also very important to uh, remember how Doppler frequency itself is defined. That was uh, this equation, this equation here. And the meaning of having Doppler frequency at all for small scale fading is that a change the, uh, the wavelengths or a change the frequency of each pass in the multi-pass effect, so that the power would uh, kind of uh, disperse in the frequency domain. So power would uh, distribute it over a range of frequencies. So we uh, now we arrive at a very uh, a group of very important uh, concepts. These concepts are very, very important in the following slides. Um, so what we see here, this figure, is uh, um, how fading changes in time domain and the frequency domain. So what is fading again? So we have received signal. We have, uh, this is what, it, what we transmitted. And then we have fading. And we normally also have noise because we have multi pass. We have a lot of pass added together. Right? So this element is uh, fading. So ideally, what we want is uh, this thing to stay constant over time and over frequency domain. So the various environment doesn't change at all. That is what we desire. But it's not actually happening in reality. In reality, uh, the fading element, it would change over time. And it would change over frequency, uh, over a, fre a range of frequency. So it change in time domain and then change in frequency domain. Um, so first, we want to introduce a concept of coherent frequency, Co sorry, coherent bandwidth. Coherent bandwidth here is defined as a range of frequencies over which uh, the fading element is considered constant. So if the fading uh, envelope is something like this, and then uh, over a small range of uh, bandwidth, if we consider the fading is near constant, 
that bundle ways is called coherent bundle ways. So I sometimes say it's channel bundle ways. Uh, I was asked a question why channel has a bundle ways. So channel doesn't really have a bundle ways. Um, so you should always say it's coherent bundle ways of the fading channel or the coherent bundle ways of the wireless channel. Um, so I said earlier that uh, when the signal bundle ways is smaller than this coherent bundle ways, then this is a benign scenario that the fading remain constant for the signal transmission. So this is also called uh, frequency non-selective fading or flat fading. The system is called narrow band system. So this is a, this is a good scenario. This is a easy scenario where you have a coherent band waves and then signal band waves is smaller. So you consider fading doesn't change over the, the signal band waves. However, if the signal band waves is larger, this would give us higher data rate. But uh, over this frequency uh, band waves, the fading would uh, change. That would cause detrimental effect. Um, we need to uh, we need to deal with it because it would cause uh, interference in the time domain. This is frequency domain. So this, when this happens, the fading is called frequency selective fading. The system is called wide band system. Um, if when, when it gets even worse, it becomes broadband or even ultra wide band uh, system. Um, but in general, nowadays, normally it's uh, either narrow band or wide band. Um, so I, I did mention that it's in our first lecture. So does anyone remember what do we do about it when we have this signal bandwidth uh, much higher than channel bandwidth? It's not, it's probably not an easy question. Anyone? The concepts today are probably all a little bit uh, difficult. So it's really important that you revisit the slides many times and uh, probably also listen to the recording of the of the sessions so that uh, uh, you can understand better. So basically what we do is uh, we use OFDM which is a principal waveform of 4G and 5G and also Wi-Fi. So what OFDM does is to divide the signal bandwidth to uh, small intervals. And then for each uh, small bandwidth of signal, it's, it would pass through the channel as if it's narrow band system. So all these small bandwidths they uh, transmit in parallel, and then for each one of them, it, it is an equivalent narrow band system. That's why OFDM is so important uh, for 4G and 5G. OFDM was uh, one of the reasons why 4G is uh, so successful, because you want a large signal bandwidth, right? That's how you can achieve a very high data rate. However, when, when the when the signal bandwidth is really wide, um, the fading would, uh, would be different over different frequency uh, range, over every small portion of uh, the signal bandwidth. So that would cause us detrimental effect. And then OFDM helps in uh, dividing that bandwidth into small uh, sub-channels. And then for each sub-channel is narrow band. So frequency selective, uh, frequency non-selective, uh, the concept of coherent bandwidth. The reason we have this at all is because uh, of mass pass. They arrive with a different angle of arrival. 
So when the destination is moving, we know that different paths have different doppler frequency. So signal power is dispersed in the frequency domain. That's why we have frequency selectivity at all. That's why we have uh, narrow bands, uh, uh, wide bands. And then different um, paths in multi paths, all the signal paths, they arrive with different angles. They also arrive with different delays. So signal power would uh, disperse in the time domain as well. So the second concept is coherent time. So if the fading fluctuation in over time in time domain is something like this. And coherent time is defined as an interval of uh, time that fading is considered constant. Um, so if the coherent time, so the symbol is a coherent time should be comp comp compared to uh, the symbol period, so the sampling period. So if uh, the sampling period is, uh, so if the sampling period is much, much more, much, much higher than, so the symbol duration is uh, much higher than, uh, uh, sorry, if the coherent time is much higher than the symbol period, so the co uh, coherent time, and then the symbol period, this is a uh, fading change over time. If the symbol period is much smaller than uh, the coherent time, then over this uh, symbol duration, the fading is considered near constant. This is a benign case. This is a benign scenario. It's, it's called time non-selective fading. And when symbol duration is much longer, so during this uh, symbol duration, the fading would have some dramatic change, then the effect is also called time selectivity. So the fading is called time selective fading. Um, so sometimes it's also called slow and fast fading. It's different from uh, what we uh, defined before in terms of small scale and large scale. So slow and fast here is uh, in regard to uh, symbol duration and coherent time. So how fast the fading fluctuates over time uh, in comparison to a uh, coherent time. Uh, so the slow and fast fading we used before was uh, in terms of the scale of the fading. So we know that there are three levels of uh, channel modeling. The first level is path loss. So signal power would decrease over distance. And then the second level is shadowing fading, where we have a sudden blockage. Um, so that shadowing fading is sometimes called slow fading because it doesn't normally uh, change at all over time. When you are in blockage, when you are blocked by a building, you block by a building, um, that situation doesn't change. And then the third level is small scale fading, which is also called fast fading because uh, in terms of scale, it change more rapidly than the signal power decay over distance and the blockage. Um, so especially bef before the era of 3G, um, different group of scientists, they call things differently for the same phenomenon. Um, so uh, it's very important that you stick to the slides. So for example, uh, for, for this uh, definition, uh, you should call them time non-selective fading. But you understand it's also some, uh, some some people also call it slow fading. Um, but uh, it describes time selectivity. So how signal power kind of disperse over time. It is caused by signals they arrive with different delay as a receiver. 
Um, so it can be called slow or fast uh, in, re in regard to uh, coherent time. And then the definition before, it was called sharing slow fading and then fast fading. It is uh, in regard to the scale of the fading. So different levels of uh, channel modeling. So when you, uh, when you write down a uh, definition, uh, concepts, a definition of concepts uh, in exams, um, it's very important to stick to uh, uh, stick to uh, uh, the slides. Let me see if you can give me five more minutes uh, to go through uh, modulation. Um, so I, I understand that you have learned 16 quam. Um, in first year and second year, uh, there is a supporting document on the course website. Uh, so I showed you before this document, you can download it from the course website. Um, so uh, last time I showed you this uh, document, it was for the purpose of uh, uh, explaining why fading channel can be a complex value. And the, it's a signal you transmit is also a complex value because it's a system quam. System quam is uh, something like, like this, right? Um, the schematic is uh, here. Uh, let's zoom in a little bit. Okay. Um, so system quam would, uh, would map four bits onto a signal, onto a symbol. So when you have a string of uh, binary beats, you first arrange them uh, to a group of uh, four beats. So the first symbol will be mapped by 0, 0, 1, 1. So there is zero to parallel converter. So we have four beats assigned to a symbol. Uh, the constellation uh, diagram tells us that uh, uh, 0, 0, 0011, 1, 1, for example, it would map, map to this point. Uh, this point has uh, real, uh, in real domain, is uh, minus d. In imaginary domain, is 3d. So we can map um, binary bits to a digital signal. And then we, what we need to do is we need to uh, uh, generate impulse response. We need to uh, generate uh, analog signal to transmit. So we would generate impulse here. So if uh, the power in the real, dom uh, real domain is D, we generate a impulse of that magnitude. But those impulse signals, they have very wide signal bandwidth. So we, 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 can't, we can't transmit signals like that. So what we need to do is we go through the signal by a low pass filter, which, which is uh, often a uh, root. Well, let me see where it, where it is. Okay, here. So this is uh, uh, in frequency domain, this is what the low pass filter looks like. Um, so originally you have an impulse and it only has power at uh, this time instant. But now, you, once you go through a low-pass filter, the power would uh, kind of spread out. What you need to guarantee is that there is zero crossing at other time instant. So that as a receiver, when you actually do sampling at this, uh, at this point, you get what was transmitted here. And then the next uh, time instant, you have another signal. Um, that is post-shaped uh, by this uh, waveform. And it also has zero crossing at other time instant. So when you actually, so for example, for this time instant, if uh, you, uh, if the power is D, then it's here. And then the next time instant, if the power should be 3D, so the wave would be higher but uh, when I drop down here, it will have zero crossing. So different waves, they don't interfere with each other at uh, this uh, sampling, uh, at this sampling time. It's 
happens. So what we get in the end is all the signals that superimpose together, uh, we get very smooth wavelengths, wa uh, sorry, waveform. So as a first time instant, um, so I said earlier that the first symbol is this one. So real part is uh, minus D, uh, imaginary part is 3D. So this is the first symbol. So that's how we generate them. And then at the receiver, we would go through, um, we would go through a low pass filter again and then sample uh, the signal. So if there's no noise at all uh, or fading in the channel, and then we sample as this uh, time instance, we get, uh, we can recover what was transmitted here. But normally what we received is, uh, something like this. So the, so the signal would be corrupted by noise and it is also faded by uh, a channel. So uh, as a receiver, um, so originally it should be minus D here, but here it's a wave becomes closer to D. So this would uh, cause a detection arrow, decision arrow. And here, originally the wave should be 3D, but now it's closer to D. So this would cause uh, arrow. If we look at it on the constellation diagram, this is what we originally transmitted, and this is what we received. So the so real part become closer to D, and the imaginary part, part become closer to D as well. So this symbol, this is what you received would be uh, detected as uh, this one, which would be a mistake. The boundaries here you see are decision boundaries. So they they kind of placed in the middle between these constellation points. Um, so when, when the receive signal uh, over the channel, when the signal uh, cross the boundary, uh, you get arrows. Um, so we will pick up from here in the afternoon. Uh, we'll have uh, another lecture at four to five. We'll pick up from here in the afternoon. Um, so after class, it will be helpful if you if you read again this supporting doc document according to the slides. Um, but I will explain a little, a little bit more in the afternoon. Okay, um, see you in the afternoon.